Namo Tassa Pakawato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankang Nama Sami So here we are, it's the, you can hear me I presume, it's the uh, half, one of the half moon nights of June. Um, so we gather together, uh, people have taken the precepts, and then uh, as is usually the case on these evenings, we have a chance to contemplate or consider some aspects of Dhamma, of the teachings. So I always like to start by considering where we are right now. So uh, <clears throat> as we know, it is June. It's coming up to the halfway point of June, believe it or not. Only a week ago, we held the Vesak here. It's only one week. Uh, the Vesak usually is held in May. But this year, because of the knock-on effects of the calendar that they use in Thailand, so everything's a bit later. So we celebrated the Vaisak on the full moon of June. And, of course, finally, summer seems to have arrived. Uh, we had a very cold early part of the week, and now it's considerably warmer. And it can also be, I suppose, considered the month of the Tudong season, uh, because many of you will probably know that certain monks and nuns like to go Tudong, they like to go uh, traveling through the country, walking, uh, going to various places. So the Tudong season has started, and in fact it was yesterday, I think, that three nuns set out. So we have three nuns out on Tudong, and very soon there'll be some monks going on Tudong as well. And on top of that, we have Lung Po Samedo and Ajahn Amro away. So they're both in Italy for a big, big ceremony uh, to celebrate the opening of the temple there. So it's not surprising that numbers here are a little bit low. Perhaps they're, they're a bit lower than I expected. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> that's where we are. <clears throat> I thought I'd just say something about what's been happening for me recently. Not that I usually like talking about these details, but it does provide a setting for what I'm going to talk about uh, afterwards. So first of all, I'll talk about... Um, Basically, it's about my health situation. So, uh, towards the end of April, I was in Ireland and teaching a four-day retreat in the Sunyata Centre in County Clare in Ireland. And on the fourth day, uh, we, we wound up the retreat around the mealtime. And then in the evening, the manager came to me and he said, oh, by the way, one of the retreatants has gone uh, home and tested positive for COVID. So that was the first time I'd heard of that. And uh, so um, we'd been sitting together in the shrine room for about four days uh, as a group. Uh, it isn't a particularly big shrine room uh, in Sunyata, nothing like the temple here. Uh, and so I should have twigged that probably I had caught COVID, but I didn't uh, feel any symptoms at that stage. But I came back and then about 10 days later, I uh, experienced uh, well, some symptoms and took a test and found out I was positive. So in, in that time, I'm afraid I infected a few people, not the most skillful thing I've ever done. And uh, <clears throat> I went down with COVID for about a fortnight. Now that's the first time I've ever had to ex experience COVID. Up to that time, I've been able to avoid it or evade it for three years. So um, that was an interesting experience. Uh, I was able to go into an isolation room. We have such things in the male vihara with my own toilet and so forth. So the first two or three days were quite rough. I was experiencing a lot of discomfort and uh, basically I just was lying down a lot. So I'd have a breakfast, lie down, have a meal, lie down, that kind of thing was going on. I couldn't even really sort the room out properly. I was so kind of uh, low. 
But the second phase was, oh yeah, able to sort out the room a bit better, sort things out better, not achieving a great deal. Third phase was, okay, well, I can do some work now. But what was happening was that the, the testing that I did was always positive. So I couldn't come out. Whenever I did come out, it was wearing a mask and with gloves on and so forth. So this was a little bit uh, depressing. But anyway, after about 13 days, finally I tested negative. So I was very glad to be able to come out from that situation. And then more recently, um, I started to experience discomfort in the mouth uh, whenever I was eating. So when I would put a upper denture in, there was a discomfort or pain. I used to think, well, oh, it's the denture. The denture isn't fitting right or, you know, it's just something not quite right. So I was kind of in denial for a while. Eventually I realized, oh no, I have to see a dentist. And I went to see the dentist on Thursday and he diagnosed a dental abscess in one of the teeth. And he said, let's take it out, shall we? So I had this tooth extraction on Thursday. And uh, before he did that, he administered about three or four uh, shots of anesthetic to the mouth, various par parts of the mouth. So, I mean, I'm very grateful for the tooth extraction, the diagnosis and so on. But uh, coming back with this um, anesthetic, half my face was uh, immobile. And so I came back for a meal and I was able to eat on this side, sort of chew with this side. Uh, but I found that... Um, it was something very disgusting about it because I wanted to blow my nose. There was something up, it's not up the nose, but I couldn't blow this side. It was just frozen. I could get it out this side. And then um, I, I just felt so very uncomfortable. I didn't want to be there. So I'd have a few mouthfuls and then I'd get up and walk around the room, trying to get anywhere, anywhere else where I was go back and eat a few mouthfuls, get up and walk around the room and so forth. So this was the experience of that particular day. But I, obviously it, it gets better, the anesthetic wears off and so forth, and I'm very grateful for the treatment. However, it does make one contemplate the nature of the body, this kind of experience. So I thought at least initially I'd talk a little bit about bodies. We all have them and we all have to bear with them. So there was <clears throat> an occasion um, several years ago, back in 2004, I was traveling in Australia and hoping to go to New Zealand, to a, a monastery in New Zealand. And uh, I came down with a health problem. So I, I wrote a fax, in those days it was faxes, to the monk in New Zealand and saying, I'm probably going to be delayed about four months because of this health problem. So he wrote a fax back, something very succinct he said, which really stuck in my mind. He said, bodies, who would have them? Bodies, who would have them? Now, the problem with the body is this. When we're young, in our teens, 20s, and even our 30s, it could be considered to be a cornucopia of delight. You know, there are so many sense pleasures we can get from the body, particularly if you're fit and healthy, if you're agile, if you're nimble, if you can play sport, if you can get into outdoor uh, activities and so forth. The body can yield a lot of pleasure. And food, drink, sex, romance, whatever you want to think of, it's all there. Although probably when you're that age, you don't think in these terms, but it's all there with a youthful body. The problem is that the body starts to age. And as it gets older, so it becomes less nimble, less agile, and less comfortable. You get more pain, more discomfort. The uh, joints aren't so uh, convenient anymore. The muscles don't work so well. You don't have the same level of energy. And even things like the taste of food and drink and so forth isn't as pleasant as it used to be. I'm not saying it's not pleasant, but it's rather like the um, example that Ajahn Suchito used. He told once, talked once about uh, the chewing gum. You have chewing gum and you start chewing on the chewing gum. It's nice and fresh, spearmint or peppermint or whatever. 
And then as you keep chewing, so the chewing gum starts to lose its flavor. It's not as exciting or as a, a, a attractive as it, as it was initially. So then we have the body aging. <clears throat> and of course, many people love to, want to live in denial about this. So uh, we have a massive industry, the beauty industry, uh, trying to shore up the body, keeping it attractive, youthful, and uh, you know, pleasing in appearance. I always was struck by the former Prime Minister of Italy, Silvio Berlusconi, who was desperate to keep his body young, and he even went to the extent of having hair implants. So we know we can have hair implants, we can have teeth implants, uh, we can have tummy tucks, we can have liposuction, we can ha dye our hair. <laughs> so there's uh, a thousand and one ways to try and preserve the body in a youthful condition, or at least a youthful appearance. But the reality is, it can't stay young. That's the reality. It's going to get old, wrinkled, bent, um, slow, <laughs> all the other things that we don't want in life, inevitably. So um, I was talking on the phone to, um, of course, the, also the organs inside won't behave quite as well as they used to. So the body can begin to let you down. You can begin to think in these terms, that my body is letting me down. It's not behaving in the way it should do. So I was talking on the phone a few days ago to an old friend who's now in his 80s. And I was asking him, you know, how are you? Uh, how's his, how are things? And he said, well, I'm not going to give you an organ recital. And I always remember, this is many years ago now, but in Hartridge Monastery in Devon, I remember going there, for, I think it was a Katina time, and Lung Po was there, Lung Po Sumato, and there was this elderly man called Eric, who was um, actually very generous. He paid for a new toilet for, for the monks uh, in, in Hartridge. And he was sort of walking around, and uh, Lung Po saw him, he said, oh, hello, Eric, you know, how are you? And Eric's reply was something like this. He said, I'm old and I'm getting older. So we can, you know, it, if you think in terms of comparisons, it's rather like this. Supposing I say to my body, oh, I don't, please don't get old. Please stay young. Please stay, you know, fresh and, and youthful and energetic. It's rather like talking to an ice cube in the sun, in the hot sun. Please don't melt. Or it's like asking a river that's flowing down through the mountains, the hills, towards the sea, please flow back upwards in the other direction. Or perhaps like a leaf falling off a tree, could you please go back onto the tree, <laughs> just for me? <laughs> because uh, the body is a condition in nature. It's what we call, in Buddhism, it's called a sankara. It's a formation, it's come together, it's been born and it has inevitably to go in this course of decline. That's the way it is. Uh, that's the way it has to be. And that's why, in some senses, it can be a trap. So the Buddha talked in terms of, he had a formula. It was, his formula went this way, gratification, danger, and escape. So you can apply this formula to many different aspects of human life. So, for example, the world, he talks about gratification, danger, and escape from the world. So what is the gratification of the world? It is all the pleasures and joys that we can experience through the world. What is the danger? The danger is that the world is impermanent, it changes, it's unreliable, it's insecure. And what is the escape? The escape is that we abandon our grasping and our attachment to the world. And in particular, he talks about, the, he used the formula gratification, danger and escape in relation to the aggregates, the five khandhas or aggregates by which we describe the human experience. <clears throat> and 
And so we come back to the body. So what is the gratification, danger, and escape in terms of the body? The gratification is the sense pleasures that we can enjoy from the body when we're young, or even a little bit older than young. The danger is that the body changes. It gets old, it starts to deteriorate, and it has to die. And what is the escape? That we abandon our attachment and grasping to the body. And in particular, that we abandon the concept that this body is me and mine. Because if we regard the body as self, and a lot of us do, it's a natural thing to, to feel, then that self is disintegrating, is decaying, is in decline, like the ice cube in the sun. And you have to ask yourself, in what way is it mine? It is mine in the sense it isn't yours, it isn't hers or his. In that sense, it's mine. But in what other sense is it mine? Can I say to my body, don't, don't get older? Can I say, don't get sick? Can I say, don't die? And if I can't say those things, is it mine? So it's a condition in nature, it's a sankhara, it has to go the way it has to go. Now there was one other teaching that he offered, another sort of triple teaching, which is somewhat similar but also complements what I've just mentioned, and this is the three prides, sometimes referred to as the three intoxications. So the three prides are pride in youth, pride in health, pride in life. So <clears throat> as a as a unenlightened bodhisattva, he said he was brought up, you know, as a as a as a lad, as a young person, he was brought up very delicately. So he had three different palaces for different seasons of the year that were more suitable in each season. He had special clothes, very comfortable fabrics. He had special food, he had special luxuries, and he had a number of attendants. But it didn't stop him contemplating these issues of youth, health, life. And he noticed that the ordinary, uninstructed, worldly person, when they see an old person, feels repelled or disgusted. They don't like what they see, it's not attractive, and he felt, he thought to himself, well, if I were to feel the same way, it would not be fitting. Because I too am liable to old age. I too will be aging. So he said at that particular moment, he abandoned all pride in youth. And the same with a sick person. If an uninstructed worldly person sees a sick person, maybe they're pale, they're, they're sweaty, maybe they don't smell very nice. They're repelled and disgusted. They don't want to be around sick people too long. It's, it's difficult. And so the Bodhisattva felt, well, if I was to feel the same way, it's not fitting, because I too am subject, or will be subject to sickness. Therefore, he said, at that particular moment, he abandoned all pride in health. And then with the dead person, the corpse, again, he noticed the uninstructed, worldly person looks at a corpse and feels repelled and disgusted. This is not what I want to be around. Uh, I'll look at it briefly and then I'll move away as soon as I can. And he said, well, if I was to feel the same way, it would not be fitting because I too am liable to, to pass away. I'm liable to die. So at that moment, he said, all pride in life was abandoned in him. So there we are, the body is a sankhara. It is going to have to go the way it has to go. Uh, it's not me or mine. So where is the suffering? Is the suffering in the body itself? 
in its failings or its changing or is the suffering in the attitude I have towards the body. If I want it to be young forever or strong forever or whatever, that's where the suffering lies, isn't it? It's the attachment to the desire that the body be different. Which brings me on to the subject of what is it we most dislike as human beings, what is it we most dislike in life? And I think there are three things that we most dislike. One is pain, another is fear, and the third one is death. These are the things we really do not like. Of course, you may come up with your own list, and um, I'm interested to hear from other people on this. But if we put fear and death to one side and just look at pain for a moment, Pain is universal and it is ubiquitous. So if we think about the human birth, uh, a child comes into the world, a little baby, and it hasn't been used to this external environment. First of all, it may be slapped to make it cry. And then the touch of the, the hands of the nurse, the touch of the people, is quite excruciating for its skin. So it's a painful time. That's why it's crying a lot. Of course, we know that it's the crying will pass and that it's a healthy sign, but for the baby, it's a painful experience. And then you've got pain all through life, and then you may have a rather painful death if you're unfortunate. Of course, we'd all prefer to have a pain-free death, uh, pass away in our sleep, no problem, and so forth. But sometimes it's not like that. Apart from illnesses, if we consider accident, for example, there was this recent train crash in India you may have heard about. It's called the Coromandel Express. Two trains ended up on the same line and they collided. And there was apparently an, uh, uh, an elderly lady and her daughter in, in that train. And the elderly lady was able to survive. She was in a portion of the carriage which didn't collapse and where there was a space, but her daughter was caught under a mound of metal. So she could hear the, the cries of her daughter, these agonizing cries, uh, and, and the, she had to listen while her daughter died under this mass of metal. Or we can take someone very famous and wealthy like Princess Diana, Princess of Wales, who, you know, climbed, if you like, to the top of society. She was the wife of the Prince of Wales. Uh, she, she lived in luxurious palaces. She had lots of servants. She had the best kind of clothes and food and everything like this. And she was, you know, um, a world famous icon, a beauty. But we know that at the end of her life, she had this terrible accident in a tunnel in Paris and she ended up on the operating theater table and she was probably in considerable pain. So pain is no respecter of class or social status or wealth or color, nationality, race or gender or sexual orientation. This is the one true equality of all human beings is that we have to experience these things, old age, sickness and death and pain. So we make extensive attempts to raise people up and to create more equality in our society. This is, this is the tendency in the Western societies. And I'm not saying this is an ignoble thing to do, but, you know, if we talk, look at it from the Buddhist point of view, everyone arrives here with a different karma, and uh, that karma has influenced where they are born and how, you know, how their life has unfolded. I'm not saying that they're a prisoner of the karma, but you know, if, we, if we take that view seriously, then there will never be equality in the sense that people try to create in the society. But the one real equality is uh, this thing about that we have to suffer. We, have to, we are brothers and sisters in suffering. 
And as I say, pain is no respecter of social status or wealth or, or race or nationality. No one is exempt. It's even worse in the animal realm. At least in the human realm, we have ways of trying to ameliorate pain and uh, contain it and so forth. But for the animals, they have to bear it, you know, bear a lot more pain. Just think about all, all the industries that create meat and so forth, and, and then um, very uncomfortable lives and very unpleasant uh, endings to their lives. <clears throat> so I'm not advocating that we never use painkillers or, you know, um, when pain gets serious that we don't do something about it. No, not at all. But I think it is very helpful if we take the time in our practice to look more closely at pain. Because the instinctual reaction of humans is to pursue pleasure and run away from pain. And this is what drew me partly to the practice, because I remember on the first retreats I went on, which was at a place called Bepton, not very far from Chithurst, there was a lady called Julia who opened up her house. In those days, there was no real place to, uh, to, to have retreats. We didn't have Amaravati. There wasn't a retreat center. So this lady, Julia, opened up her house and about, what, I suppose about 12 or 13 of us could sit together, listen to Lung Po's teachings and practice. There was, was a garden there and, and, a, and a shrine room. And on that retreat, I remember, first retreat, going through a lot of pain. Um, I wasn't used to sitting in that way. Um, my knees, hips, legs gave me a lot of discomfort. But Lung Po's mm, teachings were very inspiring. And he kept telling us, you know, pain is, can be a teacher. From pain you can learn. You can learn to let go. Uh, so that really did uh, enable me to, to look much more closely at the pain and to, you know, I felt, well, this is real. At least this teaching is something real. It's not offering you a kind of um, escapist fantasy world about reality, but it's looking at the things that we most or least like, like pain, fear, and death. <clears throat> so I was sort of managing with the pain, um, learning from the pain, I felt. Uh, and I remember on another Baptism retreat towards the end of it, uh, or to the, towards the end of one of the afternoons, uh, one of the lead uh, lay meditators was Ajahn Vimalo. In those days he was a layman, and he was usually ringing, if Lopo Sameda wasn't there, he would ring the bell. But on this particular occasion he entrusted the bell to me, because he had to go and talk to Lung Po or do something like this. So it was towards the end of the afternoon, it was getting on towards five o'clock, and I was sitting there watching the clock, sort of the hand creeping up towards five, and I thought, well, I'll hang on till five, you know, that's what I've got to do, that's my responsibility. And then the woman behind me must have seen me as the biggest sadist she'd ever come across. She started poking me. <laughs> it's time to ring the bell. <laughs> So in the end, I rang it. But the encouragement is pain <laughs> is something we can look into. The, the everyday response is, oh, don't give me pain, I, I, anything but that. But um, it's something that we can learn from. So some people come to meditation and they have the assumption, oh, if I learn to meditate, uh, successfully, then I won't have to experience pain. Somehow meditation, the practice of meditation, will get rid of pain or magic it away in some way. But this is not the case. Pain is, uh, we've just been discussing, it's, it's ubiquitous. It will always, will often come to us. We can't be in control of that. But um, if we look into it, and I was trying to look into it on that retreat, trying to look into the heart of the pain, something does change. I'm not saying the pain goes away, but we can work with it. And uh, pain is, in those cases, in those examples, is, is Dhamma. It is teaching us something. So we say pain is 
a hipasico. It is inviting us to come in and to investigate. And if we can do that, if we have sufficient patience, mindfulness, and even courage to look into pain, then it has a lot to teach us. So one of Ajahn Chah's dictums was, pain and pleasure are the same thing, there's no difference. Which will no doubt strike some people as very odd or very strange. To say that, he said that if you are like a log going down towards the sea, if you don't get stuck on one bank, which is the, the bank of pleasure, or the other bank, the bank of pain, just keep going, you'll get to the sea. So what this brings us on to is the, 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 the topic of hindrances, because we can experience these hindrances. And in particular, the two I'm thinking of are sensual desire and aversion. So if we think about ourselves in a difficult, painful situation, one of the first things we start to do is fantasize about a more sensually gratifying situation. If only I could be in that situation, or doing this, or doing that, or seeing those people, or experiencing this, then I'll be okay. Or even if it's just the relief of the pain, if this comes to an end, I'll be okay then. So we start to fantasize about possible sensual gratification. So sense desire keeps the mind moving. Um, it's looking for that experience, that gratification, which will bring it, you know, uh, irreversible happiness. We will find the happiness when we experience that particular sensual gratification. Now, in the same way, aversion is also something that keeps the mind moving, because you're in a situation, perhaps with somebody you don't particularly like, or with um, you know, some people you, you, you don't agree with, or whatever. It's a, the situation is unpleasant, so you want to come away from it. There is a movement away from the situation. And again, um, we can get caught in fantasies. This time, if we have a particular object of aversion that we don't like, person, it might be a person, it might be a situation or I suppose an institution, but if a particular person, for example, then we can think and fantasize about how we will stand up to that person, how we will tell them where they put themselves, how we will conduct ourselves in relation to them, or if we're thinking about the past, how we should have told that person what we thought about them. Or we can imagine or think about all the faults that we see of that person, you know. It's so obvious, isn't it? And then you talk to somebody else and it isn't obvious to them. So there's an element of fantasy there and of movement away from this present moment. And so both to sense desire and aversion have that in common, that we don't, we aren't free to properly investigate and uh, look coolly into the present moment. It's movement away from the present moment. <clears throat> so these are hindrances, and often as not, hindrances can, can overwhelm us or push us around. We aren't aware fully of what's going on. But what the solution is, is to recognize, well, this is a hindrance. This is sense desire, this is aversion, this is that, this is the other. And once we recognize, oh, that's a hindrance, that gives us the opportunity to contemplate what is the solution, what is the right course of action, or uh, where, where shall I place my attention in relation to this? So recognition is the key to, to uh, opening up on that hindrance and finding a way through that situation. Now, one other thing that's happened for me in recent weeks is that I've been undertaking, undertaking, sorry, uh, 
uh, um, a project for the library. And that means, uh, in this case, looking at a section called numbered 287, which is about meditation. There's something like 230 or 240 books or small pamphlets in that section. And yet there's no classification within it. Anything that remotely concerns meditation has been dumped into 287. And there's no guidance about what the different categories might be. So my job is to try and look through that and uh, come up with some kind of classification or categorization within that number. So you can imagine I've had to look at a lot of uh, books about so-called about meditation. And some of it has been very repetitive. Some of it has been very banal. Some of the more worldly approaches have seemed rather shallow. Um, I don't fully read every book, you know, I'm obviously just scoop, um, skimming through it and trying to get an idea of what this book really is about. But nevertheless, some of the writers I've come across, it seems to me, have offered some real nuggets or gems of information or advice. So I thought that um, as the last part of this little talk, I'd try and offer you some of those gems in case they're of use to you as well. I was impressed with what these, these people said. So let's start off with uh, Lung Po Pramot Pamojo. So a Thai teacher, and he's talking about concentration. And he's saying, if you want to concentrate, forcing concentration is not going to work. Forcing yourself to concentrate does not do the job. He says, if, if you think that concentration produces happiness, you're mistaken. But, he says, happiness can produce concentration. Then he draws some examples. He says, well, how is it card players can play all night till dawn? It's because they're so interested in what they're doing. Or sports spectators, fascinated by football or basketball, or whatever, can watch these things for hours because they're so enthralled by the sport. Or I think back to an experience in the early years at Chithurst when I was being trained and there was a, a young monk there whose name was Manito. Very nice bloke, but uh, he kept complaining that to Ajahn Suchito, oh, I, I can't sit through the meditation sessions because I've got a painful back. So he's allowed to go out and do walking meditation or something else. But then later on, Ajahn Suchito was telling us a story. He said, well, when that afternoon that we allowed people to see the film, the Mahabharat, about the history of India, uh, Venerable Manito could sit there for an hour and a half with no problem. So Ajahn Pramod Pamojo's advice is find an object that does work for you, that is attractive. So maybe for some the breath is, but for others it isn't. So I remember again many years ago there was a monk here called Ajahn Vipassi or Tan Vipassi and we were having a sort of session where different monks were saying things very briefly for five minutes each, something like that. And he said, well, I can't really relate to the breath. What I can relate to is the sound of an aeroplane passing overhead. You can hear one now. He could, he could concentrate on the sound of these aeroplanes, because we're on the flight path to Luton and out of Luton. And that's what would help him. So each of us are different about what is what can help us in terms of focusing and concentration? So some people may be visual types. So if they're watching a flame or they're looking at a flower or using a, a casino or there may be some other visible object that they can use that means a lot to them, like a mandala perhaps. So the visual, the, their visual assuity is very good. Or for someone else like myself, maybe a more auditory uh, type you know, listening to the sound of something, maybe a clock ticking, or for many people, the sound, the nada sound, what we call the sound of silence, is very useful as a, as a way of focusing the mind. Or for somebody else, it might be something tactile, you, you're holding a cloth or something else that 
feels very pleasant to the touch, and you can focus on that. So within the Basudi Marga, they talk about 40 different kinds of meditation object. Um, <coughs> I'm not saying that the breath is a bad one. I think it's probably the most you know, useful in general terms. But the thing is to find an object that really does appeal and that helps you to, to concentrate, to focus, following that advice from Lung Po Pramod, Pamojo. And I'll just give one addition to that, which is something I heard about uh, Ajahn Brahm. You know, as many of you will know, Ajahn Brahm um, has specialized in the absorptions. He talks a lot about jhana. So this was supposed to be a conversation between him and a monk in Thailand. So he said something like this to the monk. He said, uh, uh, if this is the mind, how can, how can you hold it still so it doesn't shake? How can you hold it still? And the monk said, I don't know. Uh, how can you hold it still? That's what Ajahn Brahm did. How can you hold it still? So another <coughs> writer that made an impression on me is a monk called Diravangsa. He led a spectacular life as a monk and then a spectacular life as a layman. Now he may not have been able to contain or control all his defilements, but he had a brilliant mind. And some of the things he said made a, an impression on me. So the first thing is this, it doesn't pay, it doesn't help you to condemn yourself or blame yourself. So many of us come to this practice, we are perhaps a bit idealistic, we have very high expectations of what we will achieve, what we should be doing, the standards we should be uh, um, getting up to. And yet we can't do it. We fall, we, we fail along the way, we suffer setbacks, failures, we disappoint ourselves. And then the tendency is to blame oneself. I'm no good, I can't do it, I'm that kind of person, blah, blah, blah. So his advice is very simple. If you get into that condemning or blaming yourself, you're not going to help yourself at all. Because you're, you're planting destructive thoughts in the mind that won't help you. And also you're creating this bad self. So the, what his advice is, see the situation as it is. Okay, you've failed. Uh, something's gone wrong, you haven't lived up to your expectations, you've made mistakes, but just see that situation as it is without investing in it, a self or anything else, and then see how best you can cope with that situation. What's the, what's the way out of it? What's the way to deal with it? What are the causes and conditions? So you can see that situation as a possibility for learning something. And if you can do it in that way, then it won't harm you. It's just another learning situation. It's another challenge. It's something that you can deal with. So that's his first bit of advice that I thought was very helpful. The second bit of advice was around some of the things we've been talking about, the pain. When we're in a painful or difficult situation, the tendency is for the mind to proliferate. So in Pali, the Pali word is papanksha. We're used to this word, uh, papanksha, or proliferation. So if I'm experiencing pain and I'm being unskillful, I don't see it just as the situation that is there, the pain. I just see, oh, the mind starts telling me stories. It says, well, this isn't, there's something wrong here. Now, you could be in danger. I'm not sure I can bear this pain uh, anymore. Because I, I'm telling myself stories and I'm believing those stories. The mind is spinning out from the actuality of the situation into something much bigger. We're inflating the situation. 
So the point is to be aware of that and to, to not get into the puncture, not get into the proliferation, but just to see the situation as it, as it really is at that moment. And then it becomes bearable. We don't have to believe those stories. So we stay vigilant, we stay non-reactive, we stay uh, detached as far as it's possible, and try to look into these situations in an objective way, if at all possible. And it's out of a mind that is cool and calm that solutions will arrive. Not a mind that is excited or negative or, shall we say, in, in a panic. The cool, calm mind is the mind that will find the solutions. And the third point he makes is this. People believe sometimes if they hold on to an opinion or a philosophy or a dogma, that that will lead them to the truth, that that will lead them to freedom. And what he's saying is that that can't do that for you. But if you can look into what you're actually experiencing, what's actually going on in your life, and investigate that properly, it's that process of inquiry that will really help you or lead you towards some kind of wisdom or freedom. Holding on to this fixed view or a fixed belief is not the way to freedom. It's not the way to the end of suffering. And then the third writer that um, well, was actually a quote of, of this nun, a famous nun called Pema Chodron. And this concerns uh, experiencing hatred, anger and hatred. So when we're, our mind is full of anger and hatred, let's say that someone has betrayed us, someone has hurt us, someone has harmed us, and we're holding on to the hatred then the person who's suffering is not the person who's inflicted the, 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 the initial wound on you, but you. Your mind is full of pain and suffering because you're holding on to the hatred. And then she says, if you fuel the hatred, in other words, you go back to certain memories or you bring up certain grudges or whatever, if you fuel the hatred, then she compares it to eating rat poison and expecting the rat to die. Eating rat poison. But if you can get to the point of forgiveness, where you can extend forgiveness to the person who's done you wrong or harmed you or hurt you, if you can do that, then you are released from a great burden. You're no longer having to carry around this weight of hatred. I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm sure she isn't too, but these words, to me, seem to ring true. So coming on from what Venerable Dhirabhangsa was teaching and uh, Lumpur Pramo Pramojo, one thing that occurred to me is it, you can't, it doesn't pay to be draconian with the mind. Draconian treatment of the mind won't work. And the image that came up was like plants bedded in a lake. So they're in the mud of a lake and the plants are standing up in the lake. And sometimes the current's coming from this way, so the plants lead this way, lean that way. Sometimes the current's coming from the other direction, they lean in the other way. And you can get down there and you can try and push the plant in a certain direction, but once you let go, it'll come back in the direction that the current is pushing it. So how do you get the plant to lean in the direction you want it to lean in? Well, you have to change the current. The current has to alter, and then the plant will automatically lean in the other direction. So what we're talking about here is ingenuity and undercutting or outfoxing defilements. So 
So coming towards the end of this talk, but one or two issues I thought I'd mention. One, one is a sense of personal inadequacy. If we, you know, in our practice, we can feel inadequate. Oh, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, it's not working, and blah, blah, blah. And then we think about the future. Well, how can I surmount those problems? How can I get over those difficulties when my practice is so inadequate? But this is the same old story, isn't it? We're projecting into the future, we're living in the future. So what's the answer? Is to come back to today and this moment and this breath. If you can live out today properly, if you can be with this breath, this moment, then the future will look after itself. Come back to this moment. There was something else that occurred, which is this. And I co I'm open to correction on this, so I'm open to having feedback. But I think within the Christian tradition and in the West, we have a tendency to blame people who are not ignorant. So I'm trying to explain this properly. So I'm talking about ignorance and uh, if you like, guilt. And so, so if you have two people, let's say Mr. A and Mr. B. So Mr. they both uh, do unskillful, selfish, or nasty things to other people. But Mr. A understands that this is wrong. Mr. A has knowledge, but he overcomes the, you know, that knowledge and he just does these unpleasant things. Mr. B doesn't have the knowledge. He's st st stuck in the mud he doesn't really, perhaps he's had such an unfortunate upbringing, he doesn't even understand that these are wrong things to be doing. You shouldn't be doing these things. So he just keeps doing them, like thieving or whatever. So in the West, in the Christian tradition, I think what we say is, of those two, Mr. A is the more guilty. He knows that what he's doing is wrong and he overrides that. He's the bad guy. But I think from the Buddhist point of view, it's different. We would say that, you know, it's not innate sinfulness or evil that creates the problems. It's ignorance. And where there is a glimmer of light, a glimpse of truth, that that is a good sign. So even if Mr. A still performs the unskillful actions, maybe later on he won't. Maybe he'll see... If he's got some understanding of what's right and wrong, he'll see, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. Whereas Mr. B is less fortunate because apparently he's so sunk in the mud, stuck in the mud, he can't see the difference. And finally, a, a question about faith. So I think we need to have faith that what we're experiencing today the difficulties that we face, these, you know, these are what we should be experiencing. This is what life is presenting with uh, us with, and this is the lessons that we can learn from. These are the lessons that we can learn from. Um, the Dhamma is, you know, applicable in all times and all places. It's just that sometimes we can't see clearly what it is we need to do to overcome certain problems, or we get, you know, we're so full of views and opinions, we, we can't sort it all out. But if we're calm and patient, you see, there are no miracles in Buddha Dhamma. The miracle is your own awareness and bringing that awareness to bear and generating insight. That's the miracle. If we can stay awake and alert and pay attention to what's going on, and maybe put down some of our habitual customs and habits and views, that's when we'll get the help that we need. And it, what it seemed to me like is, considering this, is the, the, the image it brings up is of a rock climber. I used to do some mountaineering, some occasionally rock climbing, but not very much. But anyway, the rock climber, face trying to get up the, the face of a rock. He needs to find the right handhold. He needs to find the right place to put 
his feet or foot to get up that rock. And sometimes it's very difficult. You don't know quite where to put your hand, quite where to put your, your foot, and you have to keep testing things out. But if you keep at it, eventually you find your way up that rock face. And for me, this is a good image of how we have to keep at the practice. Have faith that what we're being presented with is the lessons or the very lesson that we need to learn at this moment and have courage to keep walking that path. So on that note, I'd like to offer you these thoughts for your consideration and reflection. I wish you all well with your practice.